thanks for having me. Uh, what a what a great program for the fall here. Um, so I, I hope to be able to come to some of these. Uh, what a uh, obviously books uh, topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, office at the law school is physically in the library. Uh, that's one of the great thrills of being a, a professor at the law school. Um, so um, and and it's such an interesting time as as you all I'm sure know in in, in books and, and libraries. So. Uh, happy to have a chance to uh, talk through some of these issues with you. I was instructed to try to talk for 45 minutes, so that's what we'll try to do, um, and uh, then take some questions. So, um, but I'm happy to talk about any of these things for a long time. So where do I want to start? So I guess I want to start with maybe the state of the book business 2007, uh, and this is all arbitrary and, and, and you know, casual as it were, uh, but maybe one book per publisher's perspective on, on 2007. Why 2007? Well, you'll see why in just a second on that, but you probably have a pretty good sense of that. Um, and, and as he's a small publisher, lays out his perspective on that business, you know, one of the things that he focuses on, obviously, is, is how many books are being published, but also the distribution of sales across those books. So lots of books that aren't sold with that many copies. Um, and so you've got some monstrous sell sellers, but most books don't sell that many copies. And so you've got, I don't know if it's technically a power law or not. If you, if you do that kind of thing, you know what a power law looks like. And lots of, if you study complexity theory, you see power laws in lots of situations. It may be that shape. Um, and, and, then, and then he says, look, the truth of the matter is, uh, because we're dealing with these physical books, um, it's hard to get books in the bookstores. And so lots of books, so many of them not selling. And so uh, most bookstores don't have that many different books in them. So there's, in some sense, an inventory problem that you've got in a world of physical books. And so you start to say, well, how do we solve that problem? Many books. They're not selling that many copies, and, and you, you know, you, knowing the answer, <laughs> uh, you know where we go, and there's sort of two paths there, and so one path is, is sort of, well, um, we'll have uh, online booksellers, and they'll have large warehouses of books, and that way they can always have one copy of unusual books like Game Theory and the Law. Um, yeah, okay. Um, but that means if someone really wants to buy that book, they can buy that book, and there's not a good chance they'll get that in their average Walden books or, or you know, think about, think about the bookstores of, 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 of the past. Um, the other path, of course, is, is maybe we should go digital, right? Maybe that's what we ought to do, uh, e-books and the like. So Amazon announces the Kindle on November 19, 2007. Um, and so both pieces of, of, of the, as it were, book problem uh, play to Amazon's advantage. Uh, so Amazon introduces the Kindle, and, and David Pogue then, then you know, does a review of it three days later in the New York Times. Part of what's interesting about the Pogue review is to remember that Amazon was not the first mover in this space. Um, so there had been any number of failed ebook readers, and and maybe people who know this market really well can sit there and say, well, I understand why why you know uh, a small company like Sony. Wow, really? The Sony story is a really interesting story, right? Sony was Sony was Apple at one point. It's hard to remember that, right? I have books on Sony in my office at the law school. You know, they 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 basically invent the cassette recorder, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, the Betamax was one of the early movers in the VCR space. Uh, remarkable televisions. You would have thought that Sony would have been incredibly well situated uh, to, to, to be a leading player in this space. And then there are obviously other entrants. And yet we know at the end of the day that Amazon is the company that, so when Amazon launched the, the Kindle, it was launching into a space where there'd been a lot of failure already. Um, and it, it, la it launches at a reasonably expensive price point, right? $400, not the $69 you can buy one for today. So, so it's not obvious that this was the point of, you know, disruption, uh, though after the fact we know exactly that it was the point of disruption. And we see that disruption as you play through, uh, you know, a, a few snapshots of the book publishing industry, you see that disruption pretty rapidly, right? So if you take, 
you know, 2010 is, is maybe a, a, a baseline. You can see the sort of, as it were, the state of the U.S. book market at that point. Um, and and ebook sales, which were basically not on the chart in 2008, by 2010, they're still small, right? Still small, 6.4% of the market. And then you sort of roll forward. Now we're to 2011, and now the revenues have gone from 2 billion to, you know, 800, from 870 million to 2 billion, and now 15% of the market. And now you roll forward, and well, basically the industry as a whole is basically flat, but ebook sales are growing rapidly, um, and now up to 20% of trade revenue. Um, um, and so, so a powerful change in, 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 in how we dealt with books and this idea of mediation, which I think is so central to this, this idea that there's going, there is a screen that separates us from the content, turns, turns books into a platform business, um, and, 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 and platform businesses are um, a big part of what goes on on the internet. Um, Eric Schmidt, um, executive chair at Google, you know, gave a speech a number of years back where he talked about you know, the large platform players in that space, and he sort of put Amazon in that list. He put Google, Apple, Facebook, didn't even list Microsoft, which is a little hard to imagine <laughs> how quickly we forget. Um, but, 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 and how you manage these platforms, well, that's, 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 that's sort of where, where so much activity is taking place. So rapid change in, in the book business. I don't want to say a business that had been static since Gutenberg. That, that wouldn't be fair, right? But, but, but a, a period of change that, that um, you know, certainly not, not like anything we've experienced in my lifetime. All right, so you, you know what the Kindle looks like. So, um, but if you don't, there it is, right? Okay, if you've never seen a Kindle, I've, I've done my work here. You've finally seen one. Um, you know, the Kindle, uh, just to, to be personal for just a second, I, I, I think it's actually, I think it's interesting to think about how it changes the reading experience. So um, I read, my, my youngest child's in eighth grade, um, and I read this book with her two years ago when she was in sixth grade. Um, I, I, I will claim that this is not a book we would have read together on paper, that, that the vocabulary of the book is too daunting and that, that, you know, if we had constantly and having to go back and forth to look up all the words she didn't know, that would have been a, a pretty substantial undertaking. And to actually be able to read it and then when we ever, well, she didn't know a word, just, just touch it and all of a sudden you had the definition. That made this a very readable book for us. And so it's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's easy. And the other thing, of course, it did was, it, and, and it's sort of, you know, funny if I'd said to Emma, oh, we're going to go study vocabulary cards. That would have been really tedious. She wouldn't have done that, right? But if I said, let's go read Frankenstein, well, basically Frankenstein was a vocabulary machine. It was a stack of cards dressed up as a book, right? It was perfect. But again, perfect because of technology. Do it offline, it wouldn't have worked at all. Too much work to look up all those words. Do it online. So it's interesting. You know, there's just a little example of how the technology changes things. All right. Uh, unlike physical books, uh, paper, the e-books and the Kindle platform comes with a contract. <laughs> uh, terms of use. Um, uh, we'll, we will do a quick show of hands. How many people have read the Kindle terms of use? This is a different crowd than I usually see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A few people have read these things. Okay. Well, for those of you who haven't, today's your lucky day. Um, uh, because as a public service, we're going to read the Kindle Terms of Use a little bit together. Uh, I'm not surprised that a few of you have read it. Not surprised that Garrett's read it. You should read it. Um, so, um, but yeah, we're going to read it a little bit together. Um, and you quickly recognize you're in a very different world. Um, so this is a service. It's not a product. Um, it's not, I've given you the book. We'll never see you again. Uh, we're going to have an ongoing relationship together. Um, and we're going to be in constant contact. And that means that they can make changes. Uh, they contemplate this as an evolving relationship and an evolving device. Uh, it's not static. I've written papers about that too, any number of years ago, actually. 
uh, how we think about any number of issues and copyright or the like is, I think, quite different when you're not dealing with fixed objects, but you're dealing with evolving objects. But they're very upfront about that. So in terms of service, they look, guys, recognize full well that this may change over time. Indeed, change? <laughs> what can they do? Well, we can terminate your rights. That sounds ominous. <laughs> Um, so um, uh, we could Im immediately revoke your access, right? So, so um, again, think about the books in your library, the physical books in your library at home, right? The notion that, that someone from afar might reach out and somehow grab those books from you. Well, well that's inconceivable. Uh, but that seems to be exactly what Amazon contemplates. And indeed, it turns out that's what Amazon did. <laughs> so, so Amazon um, is obviously this platform idea. Amazon is situated between its customers, the Kindle owners, um, and then authors who want to sell their books. Um, and so Amazon is managing an inventory of e-books. And the question is, how do they manage that inventory? Well, the answer is, is, you know, they want to be open about that. And so lots of people can put books into the Kindle store. Uh, and what happened is, um, is that someone who did not have the copyright to one particular work put that into the store. Uh, someone downloaded copies of that. And then Amazon recognized that there was a problem. Uh, and Amazon solved that problem uh, by, by basically going to that Kindle that had downloaded the book and erased the book. Now, the book they erased turned out to be 1984. Um, <laughs> boy, it makes for good storytelling, right? Uh, had they erased, you know, erased, you know, any other book, who would have cared? Um, but they erased 1984. Um, now, you can, I can do both sides of that. The good news there is, is that uh, copyright enforcement is actually quite hard. Um, and, and, and every time you have to reach for a lawyer to enforce your rights, it's expensive. So to create a technology which would lower the cost of enforcing laws, that would be a good thing, um, not a bad thing. And in some sense, Amazon's ability to reach out in a situation where copyright infringement has taken place and to rectify it after the fact, that sounds like a pretty good thing. <laughs> On the other side, right, okay, well, you see the other side. So I won't, I won't linger there. So, um, so I think this came as a surprise to people, uh, though one that, you know, if you were reading the Kindle Terms of Use, may be perfectly consistent with it. Not only do we have this, this as it were, not the long arm of the law, but the long arm of Amazon issue, uh, but we also have the fact that, that uh, your Kindle is in constant communication with the Amazon mothership. Um, so information is going back from your Kindle to Amazon. Uh, and so if you are a privacy person, that's where we're going to head next, um, then, then there is a lot of information being transferred to Amazon about exactly how you're interacting with the Kindle, as they put it. And some of that sounds pretty technical, available memory, log file, signal strength. Um, uh, but, but others of it might, you might regard as, as vastly more personal. Right? Annotations, bookmarks, highlights, the same thing. And note that Amazon tells you not only are we gathering this information from you as you're using your Kindle, but God only knows where we're storing that information. <laughs> right? We make no guarantees. We're not saying it's all in Washington, the, uh, you know, the state. Um, it could be anywhere. Um, and obviously, companies have servers across the globe. Uh, locations of servers are a political issue, as you might imagine. That was true before um, uh, our NSA adventure, but even more so now. Um, and Amazon, and, and when you see this, you should, as a, you know, as a, uh, if not as a lawyer, but as someone who wants to go to law school, and I assume everyone wants to go to law school, um, you should sit there and say, well, my god, what country law applies to this transaction? Right? If, if, if they're st storing my information in, in, in Russia, right? does Russia, Russian law control that situation? Can the Russian government? Well, you, you see all the issues raised by that. So gathering information, storing it anywhere, think about the different laws that might apply. But they've got a privacy notice. They say, look, maybe you should, maybe you should reading one contract is not enough. Maybe you should read the second contract <laughs> associated with this. 
All right, quick show of hands on this one. How many people have read the Amazon privacy notice? All right, even one person. He's two, two of you. You're two for two. Okay, really impressive. All right, so, so what is, we'll talk about that in just a second. So, so, so if you go to kindle.amazon.com, you can get a bit of a window into what this gathering of information looks like. Okay, what does that gathering of information looks like? So, um, um, I read The Girl with the Dragon Tech too. Um, I, that was the first book I read on the Kindle. I wanted to read fiction on it because I didn't want to read a real book just in case I didn't like the experience. <laughs> um, so that's what I read. Um, and, and what I highlighted there was for me, and I'm a simple person, uh, was the most interesting part of the book to me, which was the idea that you might go to jail for libel in Sweden. I know there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in that book. <laughs> This turns out to be the really interesting thing. Okay. Uh, so that's what I highlighted when I read that book. Um, and that was actually, I thought, sort of interesting. All right. But I read other books, and I do more highlighting, right? And all of those highlights are available to me, right, at, at, at Amazon. Uh, so if you go to kindle.amazon.com, you can do this. You can, you can use this to take notes on the book, right? So I, I will sometimes do these and then we'll capture these and then, and then manipulate them in a variety of ways. So it's actually reasonably convenient to do that. But I think a lot of people don't have a clue that this is what's going on and that's available and that, ag that Amazon is aggregating. So uh, Amazon aggregates that. And if you want a sense of sort of where the culture is in a particular moment, zeitgeist as it were, um, this is sort of an interesting place to go because Amazon says, okay, here are the top highlights of all time, right? Here are the books that people are reading and highlighting and Amazon can aggregate those over time, right? So the top thing is, is, you know, two versions of the Hunger Games, right? Because we really want to think about what happens when life as we know it ends. And so that's, that's what you're getting in all of this and that seems to sell. I just don't get it. Uh, but okay, uh, and, then, and then some classic stuff, obviously, Jane Austen. So aggregates that, uh, makes that available, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then does what with it? Well, maybe we should read the privacy notice. So the privacy notice says, look, we do a lot of things with it. But one of the things that turns out to be interesting is that Amazon is like Google, uh, an advertising company. Uh, that is, they sell advertising. Um, so part of what the business is of the modern internet um, is to uh, gather information about your customers uh, and serve them some version of interest-based ads, right? You can, if you haven't, for example, you can go on to Google and you can see what Google thinks you were, uh, what you are. Um, uh, I went on to Google at one point and, and was delighted to learn that I was a 25 to 34 year old male. That was, <laughs> that was, that was surprising to me, um, but I, I regarded that as an upgrade, um, fine. Uh, so not perfect. Uh, they had my interests about right, uh, but, but some of the stuff wasn't quite right. But that's what you do, right? You gather information on people as they're interacting with your service and you serve them ads. And that's exactly what Amazon does, and they sort of describe that in detail. And then it turns out, well, how much of that are they doing? They have greater advertising revenues than Twitter. So Twitter is getting ready to go public, um, going to sell a billion in stock with a, maybe a market cap valuation of $12 billion. Uh, and and, and all, Twitter's revenues are mainly advertising-based, and Amazon is bigger <laughs> than Twitter with regard to advertising. And that's almost, if you're not paying attention, sort of an invisible part of the business. But all of that tracks, right? I mean, it, it tracks their ability to gather information. And now some of that information is obviously not tied to the Kindle. I have lots of interactions with Amazon, but some of that information is tied to the Kindle. All right, so where does this take us? Well, I think it takes us to a couple of spots. Uh, so one thing to, to sort of recognize here is, is that when we're talking about now these, these e-books that are being delivered, uh, these e-books are, 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 are a different kind of production and the possibility of sort of tailored production and one-by-one -one production, that's a meaningful aspect of a design. So it's not as if you do a print run 
Well, uh, w w w if only we had someone in the room who knew something about print runs. So <laughs> tell, us, tell us what a print run might be on a, on a hot academic book. I can tell you. You can tell me? I had someone else in mind, but that's great. <laughs> well, I've been in both trade publishing and head of the University of Chicago Press. And at the time, prior to the availability widespread of electronic downloads, an academic book prior to print on demand yeah. would print 2,500 copies. Yeah, yeah. After print on demand, an academic book print run became anywhere from 500 to 1,200 copies. OK. And, and just so we make sure we get it, that means at one time you print 2,500 books, and those are sitting somewhere. And they would sit for decades in a warehouse if 500 sold. <laughs> Things haven't changed a whole lot for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, typically print um, about uh, 600 copies of a, of a monograph right now, with the expectation that around 70 to 80 additional copies would be sold as e-books on top of that. So, um, so print runs are corresponding with uh, e-book and uh, POD production. But POD production primarily is on paperback, so we, and we still primarily publish them. Okay, so, so, and, and so think about, you know, the, the time, again, since Gutenberg that we've been printing books. You sort of print them, you have a print run, and they sit there, oh, what you said was so chilling, for decades is what you said, <laughs> right? No more. Um, oh, no. <laughs> you can almost go to centuries. Yeah, almost to centuries. Okay. Boy, maybe we could do a better job. And so obviously that's what this promises, right? And we should think about what the implications of that are, OK? So, so this is just-in-time delivery of content, right? So you don't have to have the content ready more than five seconds, as it were, before someone wants it. Um, you know, it really, if you go back and you think about the early days of pre-print, pre-Gutenberg, <laughs> that was sort of a one-by-one -one production system. I think that has a couple of consequences. So one means evolution of content. Talk about that in just a second. But the idea of a book as a static object, much less true, <laughs> possibly, in a world of, of online just-in-time content. And what's the model for that? Well, uh, each time I give this talk, I go and look at what the current version of Chrome is. And it always looks something like this, right? Think, think about how many different versions of Chrome this represents. And think about how, how, it's, how it's iterating, how rapidly it's iterating, and how rapidly it's evolving. Talk about that in just a second. Talked a little bit at the very much at the beginning, right, about the promise that we can have basically, instead of having books dead and unavailable, that we can have all of these books online and available all the time. Chris Anderson's term, the long tail of books. Alas, uh, the academic world is all long tail, basically. Uh, there is no head, there's nothing, it's just all tail, right? Okay, but, 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 uh, but that's the promise of that, so books don't get lost. Um, and then I want to talk about, about financing content and, and what might be possible there. So, so have those ideas in mind. So let's start with, with evolution of books. So if you go inside Amazon, um, um, you will see uh, that they have an automatic book update feature. Uh, and you can turn it on. As you can see, I haven't. Uh, opt in for automatic book updates to receive new versions of your books. And we have confirmed that improvements were made. That's sort of interesting. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I have this, uh, uh, if you ask me what uh, favorite fiction book of time, I guess maybe I'd say The Old Man and the Sea. Uh, and, and, and then I, I, I almost got a little concerned about the possibility that Amazon might want to say, here's an improvement. <laughs> it's actually a young girl, and if she's in the backyard in a kiddie pool. And, it just didn't seem very healthy to me. But I other have other books I get, the bankruptcy code, right? So that Im actually changes. I don't know if it improves, but it changes year <laughs> by year, right? Is that, is that what they're doing? So book as service, right? Um, and you could imagine uh, a book content that really evolves rapidly. Um, uh, the law business is one where we're constantly, I, 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 
I'm teaching antitrust at the fall, in this quarter at the law school. I, I don't use a case book for that. I, I just use uh, you know stuff I've edited in a PDF that evolves every year, um, and I, I really hold off sort of. I've only I've only delivered half the material because I'm waiting to see what the EU does with Google, which is what we're going to do at the end of the quarter. And so that that material is re literally evolves all the time. Uh, and that's you know I could be doing this through through Amazon, and sometimes I think I should. Um, but uh, that's what this contemplates. But that's a very different kind of vision of what a book is. And then, and then if you talk to librarians, right, do, does the library keep one of each one of them? How does that work? And what does it mean to have a, uh, 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 you know, with libraries, centuries really is the unit of time, right? That's, that's the vision they have. And how libraries are going to manage, you know, century-based archival in a world in which books are evolving rapidly as this seems to contemplate. That's not clear. Then the idea of financing. So I wrote a paper a few years ago in which I, I sort of had an idea in which I said, oh, uh, Amazon should uh, put advertisements in books. That's what they should do. Um, and the vision behind that was is that if you look at across media, um, you know, there's actually an interesting mix of how much of particular media is financed based upon you paying cash for it versus an advertiser paying to put an ad in it, so two-sided financing. Um, newspapers and magazines, historically two-sided. Books, very much one-sided, mainly cash. And if you ask, why are books one-sided? Well, <laughs> imagine putting an ad in these academic books. What product would you sell where after 100 years you think that ad is going to remain relevant, right? Impossible. The only advertisements you really ever see in books are for the next book in the series, right? That's when you see, and you understand why that advertisement might, might work. That's completely different in a world of on-demand, right, uh, a distribution of books. So because you can, at that point, if you want to put in the, the weekly ad for Treasure Island, America's most European supermarket, right? If that's, if that's what you want to do, you can insert that into the ads right then and there, basically as people are you know, reading the book that day. Um, and so the, the technology of production means that the technology of finance itself is quite different. Again, the technology. You could imagine, right, that before you turn to the next chapter, the Kindle sort of locks in for a minute or two, and here's the, here's the video, or here's the ad. And, and do you say, I'm appalled by that idea? Or do you say, no, 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 that's great, because it means that we're going to make it possible for people who can't afford books to have access to those books. That, that's exciting, maybe. Um, so I wrote a paper saying that. And then I went looking, and lo and behold, Amazon's got a patent application, right? On demand generating ebook content with advertising. Uh, so I think exactly the vision uh, that um, I, I suggested in this paper is exactly where I think Amazon thinks it's going to go. But devices now, as you know, you can buy different devices from Amazon. Um, and, and some of those are advertising support and some are not. But actually, ad-supported ad, ad book content uh, is what this points to. And so the mediation, right, I mean, it, it, as you can see, just at the book level, uh, it's, it's uh, such a rich space, such an interesting space. Now, uh, uh, evolution. Um, so, so I think this side of this is sort of changing in interesting ways, and maybe the launch of the iPad is, is where that starts. Uh, if you ask book publishers, I don't know if academic book publishers, but if you ask big six type book publishers, Amazon scares them. Uh, they are frightened by Amazon. Academic publishers? I don't know, you'll tell me. But, um, uh, Amazon frightens them, uh, and, and what they really fear most is, uh, is the word disintermediation, uh, which is the idea that uh, uh, Amazon will sign up authors, uh, it, and it is, um, and Amazon will have a platform, a lock platform. Uh, will mentioned I do DRM, digital rights management, I do some of that too, a lock platform, um, and that it will be basically an entirely Amazon ecosystem, an entirely Amazon platform. Uh, and, and the big six publishers will, will, will be kicked out. Um, their response to that, uh, as, you, as you may know, um, we're actually um, doing Thursday in antitrust, which is the Apple <laughs> eBook antitrust case. So we're doing that Thursday and Monday. Um, so that's fascinating, but not what we'll talk about today. 
But the good news from their perspective is, is that the e-reader is a freestanding device. Maybe, maybe we're, we're at peak e-reader and that the tablet will be the device instead. Apple obviously launches the iPad. And then if you look at current e-reader sales and forecasts, and this is from the Financial Times, as you can see, September 12, 2013, right? They're, they're forecasting that freestanding e-readers are sort of on the way down uh, and that tablets will replace those. We run into issues as to who controls those tablets. On my particular iPad, for example, I have three different, as it were, e-book stores on there. I have something from Amazon, I have something from Apple, I have something from Google. As long as those platforms are relatively open uh, and the tablet competition, which is a richer competition than the e-book reader competition, uh, maybe we'll see more of that and maybe that will weaken Amazon's hold just a little bit. All right. I want to switch from the book to the digital library, okay? All right. So the digital library, um, uh, Will mentioned in the introduction Google um, and, and Google's mission, modest mission statement. Uh, uh, okay, uh, you, gotta, you gotta love the ambition. Um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe the wherewithal to do that. So that is certainly uh, how Google is organized. Um, and obviously Google's been a remarkable success story. Uh, we start here, uh, and this is uh, uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2004. Google announces its Google Print service. That's what becomes Google Book Search. Um, Google says basically the Digital Library of Alexandria. That's what we're going to do. Um, and to do that, they enter into um, contracts with a variety of libraries. After all, libraries have the books. <laughs> Um, uh, certainly uh, existing books, uh, and so they enter into contracts with libraries uh, to figure out how to digitize millions and millions of books. Now as we think about what Google does, we want to think about three different types of books. So one type of book we want to think about is something like Thinking Fast and Slow, um, Danny, Danny Kahneman's book, a, a, a book that is in copyright where we have an actively managed book by either the publisher or the author. Uh, and, and, and in those, for Google to meaningfully present those books in Google Books, they're going to have to enter into contracts with the publishers, and that's what they've been doing. And indeed, you know, they'll help sell those books for the publishers. So sort of just a version of a bookstore. Okay, that's one type of book we want to have in mind. You know, they're careful about how much of that they show you. So the, pro the question as to whether people will substitute out of actually reading the book by using Google Book Search, that's something that the publisher can help manage. And so they show you some things, they don't show you other things. Um, but, but that's all going to be managed through the contractual relationships between these private digital libraries. And that's what we're seeing here. Private digital library um, and, 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 and the book publishers or authors. OK, that's case one. Case two is the public domain, uh, books that are, in some sense, available to all and, and free to use, be used by all. The public domain is actually much richer, more interesting, more complicated than that, and I'll give you just a little bit of a hint of that here. Uh, but that's at least the vision behind the public domain in the United States. Um, as we fought our way through different iterations on copyright duration, which is now life of the author plus 70 years, anything prior to 1923 is in the public domain. So. I went on to Google Book Search and I searched for a book, uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, we read that one too. We didn't get as much out of that one, my daughter and I. Um, but you can see Lewis Carroll, 1869. That seems pretty promising. So, and indeed, uh, they've got a variety of ways in which you can download that as a free ebook. That's all good. Um, now Google, um, and this is where we're going, um, has put a lot of resources into digitizing these books and so they want to manage those. And so one of the things they are nervous about are uh, automated querying systems, robots and the like. Um, you know, um, uh, Google knows something about robots. <laughs> um, uh, both the Google bot, which is what actually goes around the web, uh, and other kinds of robots, the automated car type stuff. Uh, so they give you a CAPTCHA, uh, and you dutifully prove you're not a robot, at least today, uh, and you type in the CAPTCHA, and you can download the book, uh, and you get access to it in just the way that you might think. Except, <laughs> except Google has a bit of a front notice about this, um, and Google says, guys, you should understand the following. So libraries have been doing a great job for a very long time, um, and we're helping to bring that world online. 
That's what we're trying to do here. And the public domain, oh, uh, you know, these are, if we look what they say, are gateways to the past, representing a wealth of history, culture, and knowledge. It's often difficult to discover. So Google is going to be our guardians for the public domain and bring it to us. And they're really proud to do that, just custodians. And then they say, nevertheless. <laughs> Then they say, well, nevertheless, we've got a few things we want to say to you. Um, so here's what we want to say. <laughs> this was pretty expensive to do, um, and we've got a business model. Um, and so uh, we're going to make sure that we limit the ability of commercial parties to use it. So we placed some technical restrictions on it, showed you a little bit of that already, uh, to try to, as it were, protect their investment in their copies of the public domain. And they ask us, I don't know what ask means, I mean, just that's uh, a funny word. Uh, we also ask you to, well, don't do the following things with these, non-commercial use, don't do automated querying, make sure you tell it to let people know where you got this book. So public domain work, right, again, the public domain, anyone can use it to do anything. So what Google's doing is perfectly consistent in that sense with the public domain. They've obviously spent a lot of money to create these digital copies. Uh, and they have a business model associated with that, and they're trying to protect their investments in that. So even the public domain turns out to be uh, a little more locked down than you might have imagined. Um, and, and, and Google's competitors have noticed that. Um, um, so uh, we have in copyright something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. Uh, and the DMCA is complicated, uh, but basically um, it, it says that if you put locks on copyrighted works, we're going to validate those locks, basically. So um, DVDs come with a uh, digital rights management software called Content Scramble System, CSS. Those are locked. If you try to evade that, uh, you can get in trouble under the copyright statute. Uh, that will be an anti a circumvention technology. Uh, and the DMCA limits your ability to do that. Now, we recognize that those kinds of locks maybe will be too much sometimes, and so every three years, the Librarian of Congress and the Register of, Copy the Register of Copyright um, have a rulemaking proceeding. And every three years, they'll say, okay, maybe we should create some exceptions. This is what the statute calls for. Every three years, we should create some exceptions to allow stuff to get outside of DRM. So in the most, most recent one of those, an organization called the Open Book Alliance, which included um, uh, uh, well-known uh, librarians like Microsoft. Um, well, OK, Microsoft and the Internet Archive more fairly and a variety of other tech companies came in and said, look, Google's got these books and they've locked them up. That the contracts restrict what libraries can do, but the libraries are forced to, to wrap things in these TPMs, as they're called, or DRM, depending on what you're using. And they're very clear on the idea that that's wrong, that these should always be open to everyone. Uh, so you, Copyright Office, in this rulemaking proceeding, as you can see, this came out in October of 2012, you should make it possible for us to get around those and not fear liability. We don't want to be branded as hackers. And in that rulemaking proceeding, I think the, the, the uh, Copyright Office did exactly what it should in the sense that here's what the statute says. The statute's about copyrighted works. These aren't copyrighted works. They're outside of copyright. They're in the public domain. So they said, we don't really have the power to do that here. Um, and so it's beyond what we can do here. You don't face liability for circumventing because they're public domain works, at least not under the DMCA, but we can't open those up. But there is a tussle over the exact status of these copyrighted works uh, I'm, I'm sorry, these public domain works the, that the Google has scanned. Case two. So we've got books in copyright, we've got the public domain, and then we've got something called orphan works, and that's our critical case three. And the orphan works are works that um, are in copyright, but we really can't tell who controls that copyright. Copyright runs for so long, life of the author plus 70 years, if we're talking about individuals. Um, that we find it hard to know who actually has the copyright. And if we're talking about businesses, businesses come and go. Um, and, so, and so we have a large number of works where we say, it's in copyright. We're pretty sure it's in copyright. We don't know who the copyright holder is. And the question is what to do. Um, 
the EU is moving forward on this with legislation. Uh, there's been discussions of that in the Copyright Office of, of, of legislation, and Congress has considered that. I've testified on it. Uh, but they haven't moved forward. Um, and Google said, we're going to try to move forward on our own. Uh, and, and that's what they did, and they got sued. Um, so, so the Authors Guild sues them uh, for the Google Book Search scanning project. Um, and and uh, that lawsuit um, raises a variety of interesting issues at the intersection of copyright and antitrust. And I, as Will mentioned, I've written a number of papers on it. Um, uh, but what then happens is, is, is that a settlement emerges. Um, and the, and, and uh, given time, I won't go into details on the settlement, but there was a certain evil geniusness to the settlement. <laughs> uh, and the evil geniusness to the settlement was is that this was run as an opt-out class action, which meant that you were bound by it as an author unless you affirmatively opted out. <laughs> and of course, the orphans by construction couldn't opt out because they didn't know they had rights. So it was clever in an evil way. Um, but the good news is it would have facilitated the use of these works. But the judge said, I can't do that using class action law. He does that in a pretty lengthy opinion, Judge Chin, but um, he says this is too much of a stretch. It's a bridge too far. So the settlement is rejected, and that case now is an active litigation over the fair use issues, um, uh, where Google is saying what we're doing here is a fair use. Uh, yes, we copied millions of books, and yes, that looks bad, uh, but let us explain to you why that might be legitimate. And that's got a couple of components to it. That, that case was just argued recently. But just try one version of that. Um, and one version of that, so fair use, um, statutory test, but the statute doesn't say that much, section 107 of the copyright statute. Um, uh, historically, it's been a judge-made doctrine. Uh, the current statute has a four-factor test one of which uh, everyone understands to focus on, well, is the use transformative? The more you are doing something which substitutes for the original use of the work, the more we think you're invading what the author is entitled to. The more you're transforming the work, well, the less you're sub doing something which is in substitute for what the author could have done originally. So what might that look like? Well, here's an example. Um, uh, basically large scale um, uh, studies of the use of language. So Google digitizes three and a half million books and you want to know how particular words and phrases are used over time? Study this. So study the corpus. So you're not, you're not reading individual books. You're looking across all of these as basically data points about language. Um, Google uses this if you watch some of their engineering uh, talks and I have. Uh, for them, this is a, the data set here helps with regard to their Google Translate product, right? So translation is a hard problem. It actually, as you go from very little data to a lot more data, but translation gets a lot better. Um, and so for them, this is all, all transformative uses. Um, and, and we'll see what happens. Um, as I say, that case um, uh, on, on the fair use issue, we're waiting for a decision there to see what happens. I think there's a good chance that Google might win that. Um, now, be clear, um, you know, p Google Book Search, uh, part of what they do is stuff that might benefit Google directly. Some of it might benefit us, and it's not clear, but the fair use arguments will work out in quite the same way on both of those. Uh, so that is still pending. Um, I, think, I, I think there was a promise that this was going to be really the, the, the library of our dreams. Uh, reality almost always works out to be a lot harder than that, and that's certainly what we've seen so far. Um, you know, I, I don't think Judy Nadler thinks she's going out of business. Okay, um, a couple more things about this then. Um, uh, the other issue we face on e-books e and libraries is, is, is that the publishers are very nervous about handing over these books to the libraries. Um, and so that has, I think, been a barrier to the rollout of fully digital libraries. Um, and and I, I think that will continue to be an ongoing issue. Uh, there are other alternatives. We're starting to see some of those. So the Digital Public Library of America um, is, is an effort to create a kind of public, public online library. Um, and, and, and we'll see where that goes. But, but as, as you guys know, this is just an incredibly interesting time 
from my perspective, it, it couldn't be better in the sense that there's a lot going on technologically and the legal system's all over it. Um, and and that's, that's, that's perfect. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. If anyone has any. Please, I'm sorry, right here. Being able to go through data mine it, yes. is that going to then have an effect on major journal publishers like Elsevier and Wiley, who also have large collections of yeah, digitized journals? And if somebody just wants to go in there and look for one particular thing to see how it's used over time, like a cell or something like that, is that then going to also be open outside of their contracts? Yeah. <laughs> so I have no idea what the contracts say. Maybe someone in the room knows. I have no idea what the contracts say. Right, so we'll start with that. I haven't looked at those contracts at all. Um, we, we know, obviously, uh, that, that those publishers, on the whole, take a very aggressive stance. Um, and and I'm, I assume they're sitting there saying, well, this is a really interesting service that we should sell to somebody. Maybe right? No. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, you know, now ask, ask do we think that, that, that the JSTORs of the world should be, right? I mean, I think that's a different question. Please. Uh, to, the extent, to the extent that um, you, Randy, I think very, did a great job of presenting the book side of this. But yes. What you're, what you're not really touching on is the fact that all this is viewed as content. And I think it goes to the question about the journals, because these days, content as such is viewed as just words and information, and it's not necessarily bound by the book. And, and Google is very much going after the book market, but I think they're just looking at that now, is that, is that the amount of money and the amount of um, proprietary information that's tied up in the journals and the way that the journals are tied back to societies and everything else, I don't think they want to go there. They'll, they'll, they'll not go there for a really long time, but, but it, it goes to the point about, you know, are these, are these books any more bound by that construct? And uh, more, more and more they're not. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, 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 so and, and, and you're right. right. This, this is, is, if I say it's a book centric talk, it is. But yeah, so. You have, you have to put bounds on it somehow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Please. Uh, speaking of books, the, um, I was involved in the National Endowment for the Humanities discussion of the Digital Public Library of okay. America. And uh, because it is so fraught still with issues of copyright. The focus that they keep talking about is on historical work. Public domain stuff. And public domain sure. stuff, which is the way Google started out. Yep. Um, initially, 2004 to 2007 or 8, that was their focus, and that's what the four initial four libraries, well, Harvard anyway, gave. Mm -hmm. Um, they got into big trouble once they went for more contemporary work and works that were under copyright. Uh, is it the view within the legal profession that copyright law will change to allow for this kind of access? I, 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 I don't know how you figure on that in the sense that uh, if you go to talk to members of Congress about this, and I, as I say, I participated in some of that, I mean, I think they, to a person, recognize, this is what Judge Chin says in his opinion as well, that a legislative solution is clearly the way to go. Oh, let's just be clear. We're talking about, for that, the, the orphan works, right? For things that are actively managed, I'd be really surprised if, if Congress intervened on that, right? I mean, the big six publishers are going to show up and say, we're doing just fine with regard to controlling our rights. Don't take anything away from us. So even the uh, death plus 70 years, it, 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 Congress could act on that. I mean, they could. <laughs> um, and in which direction do you think they're going to go? <laughs> what I mean by that is the, the whole history of US copyright law is one of extension. Extension. So the, the original 1790 Act was 14 plus 14. So, so it's been one of extension. Um, you know, the, the last version of the extension, which took us from life plus 50 plus, to life plus 70, we think of as the Copyright Term Extension Act, the Sonny Bono Extension Act, or the Disney Act, depending on how you like to talk about it, right? Um, and, and, and the, you know, the prime mover behind that was the great fear that Steamboat Willie would go into the public domain. Steamboat Willie being the original movie with, with Mickey Mouse. So, um, my sense is that since the advent of these technologies, the, the power has shifted. 
Well, so when you say the power has shifted, two things on that. So one, we, we're, we're still going to have to confront the fact that, we, as Congress would say, we exist in an international system and life plus 70 follows the Berne Convention. So we'd have to figure out what we're going to do about the Berne Convention. It's fair to say, and we've seen this on the next iterations, so, so when statutes like SOPA have tried to go through, you've seen it, it's easier for people opposed to copyright to organize. They haven't, they haven't rolled anything back. Right? And you're looking for rollbacks. Nothing's been rolled back. New things have been stopped. Nothing's been cut back yet. Please, please, hear first. Well, my, my sense is that copyright's one issue, but the other issue that's really impacting ebooks and ebook readers is the DRM. Yep. Um, and I'd say this as someone who reads ebooks, and I won't go to one uh, seller because. I bought a book from them, and now I can't read it on another device. Yep. And because it's not the copyright issue, it's the license issue. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's no question that um, part of what, what you know, Bezos has done, Jeff Bezos, Amazon obviously, has done is to create a lock platform, right? And, and, and that's, that's an important part of his business model. Um, and again, the, will we see pushback on the DMCA? Maybe, right? So, so, but, but, but you will see it. You know, the the first wave of that is is with regard to unlocking cell phones. That's that's the current hot. I say hot, but that's the current legal issue with regard to DRM. Where maybe you're going to see a, a cutback on that. There, there was a, a a cell phone issue in the in the last anti circumvention rulemaking proceeding, and, and it didn't get through. So you could see. A, a Congress acting on that because maybe the public cares. You're going to have to be as a DRM victim uh, e of e-book reader. You're going to have to be a lot more active in Congress. If, if yeah, you see where that goes. Yeah. Will you next, please? So, an important subset of copyright law is VARA, the Visual Artist Right Act. Correct. Books oftentimes can Importance an interesting claim, but, but <laughs> it, it exists in the statute, right? There's just not that many of those cases out there. Though I'm doing the Chicago wildlife wildflower case. Do you know that case? Oh, it's such a good case. It's, a, it's about a garden in Grant Park. Oh, that one. Oh, so good. Okay, any, any of it. Um, <laughs> books often contain images. Yes. What does all of what you're talking about today, going from VARA to apply to books like comic books, yeah, um, and then going from books to the ebook thing? What is yeah, so so that's really interesting. So and and the 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 photographers uh, were active. Uh, you know, if I say active bystanders, that sounds a little odd, but active bystanders is about accurate in the Google book search litigation. And, and um, they wanted uh, 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 a similar treatment, but a little different. Um, and and that, was, that was turning to be a roadblock. So, so I think the answer to that is, is no one really knows what's going to happen there yet. And, and everyone recognizes that that's a, you know, a, dis, a distinct problem that hasn't yet been resolved. Please. So uh, we already talked a little bit about platform lock-in and the fact that, that Amazon sort of has you. You can't read their books anywhere else other than a Kindle or a Kindle app. Yep. Um, and people don't seem to be making much of a stink about it yet, but are there antitrust on all the No. So, 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 so the, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting in the sense that, um, the, the, the disconnect between what antitrust professionals say about the Apple eBook case and what the public says is, is sort of interesting. And that's what the, you know, and the publishers were, you know, amidst their cartel with very nice lunches. Uh, that's what they would say they were trying to do. So, so, so they would say, my God, the, the monopolist in the room is not us. <laughs> it's Amazon. And why aren't you guys doing something about Amazon? Um, and, 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 and the uh, judge, um, what's her name? Uh, but the judge in the Apple eBook case at the very end of a pretty lengthy opinion says, that's not how antitrust law works. You guys don't get to violate antitrust law because someone else is over here doing something that might be problematic. 
And then the problematic piece of it is you go, you know, and, and it's, it's, I don't say it's curious, but, but U.S. antitrust law is very clear that if you go out and compete in the marketplace and win legitimately, you get to have a monopoly and you get to charge high prices, and that's, that's the American way. Um, uh, the Alcoa case, Judge Learned Hand says that in a very clear way, and the Supreme Court says it more recently in the Linkline case. So we're going to have to identify exactly what they're doing that's problematic. Now, could you made a, make a, a case out of, you know, technological refusal to deal? Well, that's the kind of thing you ask on antitrust exams because you say, I don't know what the answer is, but let's see what they say. Um, <laughs> but um, because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a really interesting question, but that's, you know, we certainly haven't seen that yet. Um, certainly haven't seen that yet. Sorry, please. Just, just to follow up, we, we talked just before the talk about um, uh, another area of interest of yours, which is network yeah, industries. industries. Yeah. And I, I'm sort of I'm wondering about that in relation to this idea of platform lock-in versus the sort of fledgling EPUB or like an open standard yeah. for eBooks. Right. Is there any um, is there any precedent or any sort of historical analogy that might suggest that an open standard for ebooks could win over Apple or Amazon? Well, I don't, yeah, that I, I mean, yeah, I don't know what to say on that in some sense. I mean, it, it's interesting, obviously, to see where uh, open approaches succeed, right? So I, I take it we think that Apache's been an enormous success, right? Um, and I take it we think that, that Linux and Android's based on Linux has been. Uh, an enormous success, and certainly, if you you know the simple version of the story between um, the IBM PC and the Wintel platform, Windows Intel chips versus the Macintosh, is one of open versus closed, right? And so, so we've played out various versions of that over time, and, and boy, certainly the people who believe in openness would say that the history there is is that open beats closed. Now, Apple's been making a lot of money running a pretty closed system, right, most recently. Uh, though on that even, right, the and if you look at market share figures on Android versus iOS, Android's taken off. Um, and, and, and iOS is, you know, in this, it depends on what country you're talking about, 17% range. And so even though Apple's obviously incredibly valuable, it, it, it's, it starts to look a little bit like a replay of, 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 of the first round of this. More questions? Oh, I'm sorry, please. Uh, <clears throat> how does the like plus N principle in the DMCA apply to institutional copyright holders? It's yeah. even in principle, you can end up with perpetual copyright. Yeah, so, 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 the, so the duration figure, I think, on corporations is 120 years. So it's, it's a number rather than life plus author, right? And so and 120 years is a long time, but at least you're, you know, it's, it's not in perpetuity. Please, please. Yeah, uh, I'm not a law student, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer okay. this question. But if Amazon has a rent versus buy status on some of their books, yeah. but at the end of the day, buy is really a renting license anyway. Yeah, buy buy is sort of interesting, and, and, and people there's been you people have started to notice that, and, and you know is that a deceptive trade practice? Okay, I don't know if that's where you're going, so. Um, why isn't the first sale doctrine more used to combat this excessive licensing? That yeah, yeah, good. No, that, that was uh, you're not a law student, but that was a perfectly fine question. So, 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 uh, just to do a little law for just a second. So, so we we have this doctrine uh, 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 called the first sale doctrine, which emerged from uh, the early days, the early 1900s in U.S. law where uh, there's this great case involving Macy's where the book they had, it came with a, a restriction stamped on the book which said, well, you have to sell it for uh, some price, at least a dollar, something like that. You can go download my slides and see, see actually the image if you'd like. Um, and, and in the Bob's Merrill case, interpreting the language of the Copyright Act as it was then, and, and we, the big picture Copyright Acts are basically 1909 and then 1976, so pre-1909, um, basically said, well, once you've sold the book, they can do whatever they want with it. And then we embrace that in the statute, and we have this first sale doctrine. However, 
for sale, right? Sales. And so then the question is, what's the status of licenses? Um, and and uh, the European Union has moved down a path, basically, uh, and they've got this case involving used computer software. And I've got a blog post on it, if you go search on, if you want to read it, um, which talks through what they did there. And they say, look, we recognize that you're calling it a license. But everything you've done it makes it appear as if you've fully passed everything associated with ownership. So you're just making up words. You're calling what is actually a sale license. We're not going to let you do an end run on first sale that way. The U.S. cases, and there have been two or three of these in the Ninth Circuit, and, I, and again, I have some stuff on that online you can find as well, have not gone down that path as well. The Werner versus Autodesk case, I think, is maybe the leading decision. Um, the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on that yet. Um, so, so in, in a, and there is a push, and you asked about changes in the political landscape. There's certainly a push towards, um, a political push towards expanding first sale uh, for a digital era, but, but Congress certainly hasn't moved on that yet. Please, please. Why are the big five publishers so down on the Obama administration? Not a clue. <laughs> So I mean that seriously, though. I don't politics. Pfft, you guys do that, not me. <laughs> because though they they the case wasn't brought against Amazon, rather than. I don't know. I I I I really don't have a clue. So I mean I don't know anything about that. I mean so, um, I mean I'm I'm sure. I mean look, there's no doubt that they thought that this lawsuit brought against them by DOJ was was. You know, a misuse of, 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 of resources um, compared to what they should be doing vis-a-vis -vis Amazon. I will, say, I will say that on the Apple case, the case against the publishers is a complete no-brainer. Complete no-brainer. And there's this one chart in the, in the opinion of basically after they do the deal with Apple and then they roll over Amazon, there's this sharp hockey stick discontinuity in ebook prices. So the, the, the DOJ says, guys, we, we, we enforce against cartels when prices go up to consumers, and, and that's what's happened here. What, what's your complaint? The case against Apple, and that's what actually gets litigated, I think that's actually vastly more interesting. But, but the case against publishers is just plain vanilla. Easy. You, 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 all, the, the number of contacts that these publishers have with each other to discuss prices Whoa, shocking, really shocking. Yeah, again, the Apple piece, I think, is much more complicated. That's what we'll do in class Thursday and Monday, if you want to come. <laughs> There's actually very little room in the room. Anything else? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.